these in the years they were there. At the age of 17, he failed a physical test for entrance into the, the Coal Polytechnic and decided to join the Navy. King Louis Philippe approved his plan and he previously explored much of the Pacific Ocean. He then set course, the king wanted him to find the South Magnetic Pole and claim it for France. If that was not possible, he had to get beat Weddell's most further south, so he was tasked with. He named a deli land and their deli penguins, named after his wife, Adeli, her nickname. His first attempt failed, he was stuck in the ice, many crew died of scurvy and dysentery, and deserted when they reached Chile. On his second attempt, he planted the French flag on an islet offshore and named it Terre Adeli. Conditions on board rapidly deteriorated. Most of the crew had signs of scurvy. The main decks were covered in smoke from the ship's fires and bad smells and became unbearable. By 1838, he decided he was not able to continue any further south and he headed further north. And he doubted Weddell's accuracy of his statement. He's also famous for, an, oh, here he comes, there he goes. He's also famous for dying in France's very first train crash. Two years later, he got back to France, the Versailles train crash of 1842. 55 people were clued, killed, including Dergal. He had a very hard time with it because he was being undermined by other officers in the French Navy who wanted him to fail and they poached away his crew. They made sure he didn't have access to the best people. But he did an enormous amount of um, surveying and charting as well. Ah, US Navy Charles Wilkes, a very, very different kettle of penguin fish. <coughs> Wilkes Land is named after him. He was born in New York City on April 3, 1798. And he was an orphan, very orphan, very young, grew up in many orphanages, and he had a massive chip on his shoulder, a massive inferiority complex. That drove him through his career. Now, the US Antarctic expedition was plagued by troubles. The ships were said not to be worthy, it was underfunded, and every time they offered it to a captain, he'd say, no way, I don't want to take this on, this is a, you know, this is a real burden this is going to be. Except Charles Wilkes. He put his hand up and said, I'll read it and I'll succeed. Well, he did succeed, but at great cost to his crew, to the men he encountered. He was quite a tyrant of a captain. Um, he treated his men severely. He lost several of his ships when he shouldn't have. He treated the native people they encountered appallingly. There he goes. So we have five ships, many scientists who seem to be very haughty and strict. On their way to Antarctica, they visit Fiji and Hawaiian Islands. In Fiji, they expedition kidnapped the chief, charging him with the murder of the crew of an American whaler previously. And in July 1840, two of his sailors, one of whose his own nephew, were killed while bartering for food. His retribution was swift and severe, and according to accounts, 80 Fijians were killed in the incident. When he got back, he actually suffered two separate courts martial for his ill treatment of his crew, another one for ill treatment of Islanders. And anyone familiar with the book Moby Dick, Captain Ahab is based on Charles Wilkes. He claimed to have named Antarctica. Other people dispute that. He claimed many claims which were later disputed. To show what a difficult personality he was, during the US Civil War, he fired on a royal mailboat and boarded it forcibly to remove two Confederate diplomats. It was a huge incident known as the Trent Affair and nearly had the United Kingdom brought into the war. He was accused of lying land before Durville had sighted it. In fact, two of their ships met while they were travelling. But after misunderstanding, Wolf's fleet sailed off in a half. Historian J. Gordon Hayes said of Wilkes, out of at least eight new lands which Wilkes claimed to have discovered, six have no existence, the seventh is improbable, and only one was a possibility, but already discovered by Verbal nine days before. So a very complex, strange man was Charles Wilkes. A third contender was British and James Clark Ross, probably the best qualified of all Antarctic explorers or polar explorers at the time. 
He'd already been to the Arctic on several expeditions, run by his uncle, Sir John Ross, and four led by Sir William Parry, who found the North Magnetic Pole in 1831, then led a long Antarctic expedition from 1839 through to 1843, and had more success with his crews than the other two did. Victoria Land was named after him. He commanded HMS Erebus and HMS Terror, two ships that would be familiar to every Canadian in the audience, because they were the later ships that Sir John Franklin took to try and find the Northwest Passage, which were lost in the ice and only very recently discovered. And here's a painting of the time showing the Erebus and the Terror coming past the mountains of named after them, Mount Erebus and Mount Terror on Ross Island. So that the volcano of Mount Erebus and Mount Terror on Ross Island are named after the two ships. Ross Island, where the major American base is, is situated just about here. And we'll talk about that when we talk about Scott and Shackleton's expedition to the Pole, leading from Ross Island. On the island is two massive mountain volcanoes. The two ships were actually originally mortar ships for firing mortars off the ships that were very, very strong, very solid, and they were able to withstand the ice. So Ross went deep into the, what's now the Ross Ice Sea and they found what's now called the Ross Ice Shelf. At the time it was called the Barrier, the Great Ice Barrier, rising many hundred feet from the sea, 200 feet or so high, and he sailed along it for 250 nautical miles trying to find any change, but there was just this massive barrier. So I'm giving first prize to giant James Park Ross, second prize to Dermot D'Urville, and third prize to Charles Wilkes for their endeavours. But then, Ross went and did something a bit silly. He said, there are no scientific discoveries or problems worth exploring in the far south. And that led to a huge hiatus in exploration. People thought, well, if Ross said it, he's pretty important, therefore there's nothing to do. So for 20 years or more, there was a complete lull in Antarctic exploration. If not, they did all the different expeditions we talked about. They'd come across the poles, they different colours. Cook, Bellingshausen, Dermot Durdle, Charles Wilkes, James Ross first, James Ross second. And you can see how we're bit by bit filling in the map of Antarctica. So, next big question. Who was the first to step foot on Antarctica? Well, again, we've got a couple of contenders. The first most likely landing was an American sealer, Captain John Davis. 7th of February, back in 1821. He was a seal hunter from Connecticut. He thought he may have been the first person to set foot on Antarctica. His logbook reads, commenced with open cloudy weather and light winds, ascending for a large body of land in that direction, southeast at 10 a.m., closed in with our boat and sent her on shore to look for seal. I think this southern land to be a continent. There's his footsteps. <coughs> But not everyone accepts his claim, though, whether he was on one of the offshore islands rather than the continent. Next contender, Mercator Cooper. The ship's captain, who's credited with the first formal American visit to Edo, now Tokyo, after he rescued some stranded Japanese seamen. They made a landing on the ice shelf, saw numerous penguins, no seals. Their chief objective was seals, which they failed to find. He landed on Oates Coast, over on the side may have been the first step, but again, some people dispute it. So the first undisputed, well-documented landing on Antarctica was on the 24th of January, much, much later, 1895. And here we have three contenders. <laughs> Who's messing with my laptop? Seriously. There we are. So this was all on one ship. The Norwegian ship Antarctic went ashore to collect geological specimens at Cape Adair. And there were three claimants all in the boat at the same time. There was a captain, Lady Christensen. There was Karsten Borchkovink, we'll talk more about later. And Alexander von Tungelman, a young Kiwi. So here are their claims. The ship's captain said, I was sitting foremost in the boat and jumped ashore as the boat struck. Von Tuzelman said, no, I was in the bow and jumped out first to steady it so the captain could disembark. And Borchkarin said, as soon as the order was given to stop pulling the oars, I jumped over the side of the boat. 
So that first undisputed landing, they have to call it disputed landing. And there's even a picture of Borch Gravine jumping out of the boat, so it must have happened that way, right? If there's a picture, it can't be wrong. <laughs> So I'm going to give it to Bon, let's have a look who we go over and maybe give it to. I'm going to give it to Bon Tungzorman. Because I reckon that time, having someone to jump out and steady the boat for the captain would have been durable, and that would have been very much the norm, and the captain would have wanted to be the first, even whether Borch Gravink tried to jump ahead of him or not. Next big question, who was the first to overwinter in Antarctica? Now, here's an interesting story. The Gerlach Expedition of 1898, led by the Belgian Adrian Gerlach. We're going to sail down the Gerlach Strait, named after him, and we're going to see some of the places he named. One of the first guys to sail right down there on his ship. He was a Belgian sailor, frustrated by his monotonous work on the Ostend Dover Ferry. He offered his services to King Leopold II for an expedition to the Congo. He was turned down. He tried to join the Swedish expedite, Antarctic expedition, turned down, so he said, I'll do my own expedition. His ship, the Belgica, however, became trapped in the pack ice of the Antarctic Peninsula. He'd already charted and named some 20 separate landings, and they crossed the Antarctic Circle. He thought he could push on a little bit further, but the ice crept up and seized them. Now, his crew was a real mixed bag. They had from many, many different countries. There was no one common language amongst them. They'd sat, they lost their cook before they started the journey. One of the other crewmen volunteered, so I can cook. He was lying, couldn't cook at all. All he could do was warm up a tin of food. They said the food on board was appalling. They didn't have enough cold weather gear. And here they were stuck in the ice, needing to spend the whole winter there. You can see on the map where they were stuck. And here's some photos taken of the ship at the time, iced in. We're lucky because we have some photos of the ship taken by one of the photographers on board. But also, they were very lucky because they had two key individuals with them. But first of all, the crew was suffering extreme physical and mental torment. Some went mad, but just not prepared for the dark winter on the ice. But the two people they had with them was a young Frederick Cook and a young Roald Amundsen. Frederick Cook was one of the claimants to be first to the North Pole, and Roald Amundsen, we know, from first to the South Pole. As young men, they joined the expedition to get more polar experience. Cook was a doctor, and he had a theory. Now, they knew at this time, they were understanding about scurvy, and they knew what was causing it. The crew was starting to get scurvy. They knew fresh meat was a good cure for scurvy, fresh meat and fresh vegetables. He posited that frozen meat may be as good in vitamins are not known at this stage, but maybe frozen meat. So they froze a lot of penguins. He pulled the penguins out, so they cooked them and gave them to the crew and the men. Girl ash was in the cabin with depression, wouldn't come out, but the crew started recovering, eating frozen meat. So it was quite a, a, a scientific breakthrough for them as well. Frederick Cook has written a book called Through the First Antarctic Night. Um, they did details the, the trials they went through and how him and Abbotson contrived to invent many devices, to invent ways to keep the crew happy, to keep them try and break out of the ice over the whole year they were there. Now, Cook described eating penguin as a piece of beef, odoriferous codfish, and a canvas back duck roasted together in a pot with blood and cod liver oil for sauce. You'll find, you won't find that on a placard up in the Garden of Bistro. <laughs> so there were 13 months trapped in the ice. Eventually open water was about half a mile away. And they tried digging trenches, they tried dynamiting the ice, they tried everything they could to get towards that open sea. Eventually, the storm broke up and they would get there and barely escape before being stuck for a second winter. I said some of the crew had gone mad to the point one man hopped over to the ship and said, I'm walking back to Belgium. <laughs> and they had to force the Australian and put him back on board. There's been question whether the Galash had intended to overwinter or not. Was that in the back of his mind or something he planned? We don't know. So I'm going to give first prize to Frederick Cook and then Roald Amundsen. 
and then to Adrian the Gurlash, because without Cook and Robertson, it's doubtful whether the crew would have all survived. But Adrian de Gerlache's expedition on the Belgica heralded the start of the heroic age of Antarctic exploration, the one that really fires up people's imaginations. Intensive scientific and geographical exploration, 17 major Antarctic expeditions from 10 different countries, all wanting to be the first at something. So here's a list of the different expeditions we have. You can see the Belgium, UK, UK, Germany, Sweden, UK, France, UK, France, Japan, Norway, UK, Germany, Australia, UK, UK, UK. Interestingly, many of those are part of the first territorial claimants who became the first claiming territory in Antarctica. So a quick look at some of them. The Southern Cross, this was by Karsten Den Borchgrevink, who remember tried to be the first ashore in Antarctica. He went back and organised his own Antarctic expedition, 1898 to 1900, Anglo-Norwegian polar explorer. He was the first to overwinter on the Antarctic mainland, first to use dogs and sleds, first ascent of the Great Ice Barrier, farther south, recorded 7830, and calculated the location of the South Magnetic Pole. You might ask, why have we never heard of him then? I'll explain why. Also, there was the first person buried on the Antarctic continent. The zoologist Nikolai Hansen died of an intestinal disorder. They had to dynamite the ground to bury, to bury him, to dig his grave. So he got back to England, and Sir Clements Markham of the Royal Geographical Society he was the man who was really overseeing all the great explorations of the era. He announced boldly, look, look, look what I've done. Clements Markham was interested. You didn't do it under the Royal Geographical Society? Forget it. So very few people have heard of Borch Gerick, even though he achieved enormous things. Next major expedition was Robert Falcon Scott, his first expedition to the Pole aboard the Discovery. He was the first ascent of the Western Mountains in Victoria Land, discovered the Solar Plateau, and the New Farther South of 1817. Anyone who's been to Dundee in Scotland, you can go aboard the Discovery, it's, it's alive, it's still there, and you can check out the bunks and the cabins and walk around, it's amazing. He took a young man with him called Ernest Shackleton. Here's the ship by the side of the bay, they're coming ashore. Again, we talk about Ross Island down the site here, so they pull the ship in, built huts as the ship became iced in for the winter. So here are some very rare photos taken from a, a recently discovered photo album from that Discovery Exhibition. And the people here you see Ernest Shackleton, Captain Scott, and Dr. Wilson, Scott's lifelong companion. They made a bold attempt Let's push on to the South Pole, let's give it a go. They, went, they never even got off the ice barrier as they travelled across. They weren't talking about travelling in Antarctica, but didn't get that far really. The three men who went, Shackleton, by his enthusiasm and strength, was taken on board. But it was the start of animosity between Scott and Shackleton. They went as far as they could, running out of food and supplies, turned around to come back, and Shackleton had a collapse may have been scurvy, he may have done other things. Scott never forgave him for that. They went, they had to carry him on the sled as far back as they could, then he recovered and came into base with them. And it was the start of this forever tension and mosty between Scott and Umberton. And we'll talk more about that. Now, Scott chatted to him, we'll talk more about that later. So, what do you do when you have a problem? You get sent home, sick, you start your own expedition. Shackleton's first expedition was 1907-09, the Nimrod expedition. It pioneered the first use of motorised transport. New farther south yet again, first to reach the Polar Plateau, first to climb Mount Erebus, and the first to reach the South Magnetic Pole. Here's as close as he got. He got to within 97 miles of the Pole before they ran out of food. And his choice then was, shall we push on and reach the Pole? or we turn around and go back. Fame and immortality, in name only, and die on the return journey, or what? So he turned around, came back, and he said to his wife, better a live donkey than a dead lion. <laughs> but he pioneered the route that Scott later used to get to the um, plateau. Then we have a series of spectacular failures. The first German Antarctic expedition of 1901, stuck in the ice. Swedish Antarctic expedition, a 
about the same era, marooned after sinking of this expedition ship, men stuck in different areas. One had to build a hut out of rocks and live out a whole winter on a penguin colony. Japanese Antarctic expedition of 1910 to 12, stopped by sea ice, though they later were able to land on the mainland. Then there was the great race to the South Pole, 1910 to 11, between Scott and Ullerton. And I've got a talk just on this, we'll do later in the, uh, in the voyage, discuss how Scott from his team from Ross Island, Armitage um, of the Bay of Wales, how they both tried to get to the South Pole before the other. We know it didn't end well for Scott and his men, and did much better for Armitage. So I'm giving first prize to Roald Armitage, first man to reach the South Pole, second prize to Scott and his party, and the third one was not until 1956. Over 40 years later, mm. until the third person, the third party to reach the pole. US Navy Admiral Dufek led an expedition that flew and landed at the South Pole. Interestingly, by that stage, there was no remains of the tent that either the British or the Norwegians had put there at the South Pole because there's a slow drift of about a metre or more a year, and that will slowly, slowly be covered in ice. So it's estimated today that from the South Pole, Amundsen's tent is maybe two or three kilometres away from the pole and about 30 metres underground. Also, interestingly, when Scott and his men died on the Great Ice Barrier coming home, they're slowly being carried forward. So they'll eventually get home, they'll eventually get to their base on Ross Island. Next one, the famous Shackleton expedition. Stuck in the ice expedition ship sank. We'll have a talk just on Shackleton for the Shackleton fans. After the heroic age, still things of great importance, the Commonwealth Trans Antarctic Expedition of 1955 to 58, led by Sir Vivian Fuchs. He planned to travel to the pole and keep going right across the continent. He recruited a New Zealander called Sir Edmund Hillary to lead the support team from the other side. Sir Edmund Hillary, recently famous for climbing Mount Everest, the Tenzing Royale. His, his job was to lay depots. So Vivian Fuchs would get to the pole and have all these supply depots ready for him. They used massive firms from tractors, towing their living quarters, towing all their belongings. He was the plan. Hillary would lay the depots. Vivian Fuchs would continue across the journey. However, Hillary was doing really well with time and he got to his last depot about a day or two's travel from the pole, looked his watch and thought, yeah, let's push on. And so they pushed on, got to the pole, Vivian Fuchs wasn't there yet. When Vivian Fuchs did arrive, he was furious, because Hillary got to the pole before he did. And that was again, years of animosity between the two men. You can see on their faces how well they get on. Okay, who was the first known woman in Antarctica. Ingrid Christensen and Matilda Wegger. Ingrid Christensen, Nick Dahl, was the daughter of Alfred Dahl and wholesale ship owner, Thor Dahl, who was time one of the largest merchants in Norway. She went on several expeditions down to Antarctica with him. She made four trips with her husband on the ship Thorshaven in the 1930s. And she became the first woman to see Antarctica in 1931 the first woman to fly over Antarctica in an aeroplane in 1936, and the first, first woman to land on the Antarctic mainland in 1936 and 37. So on her four journey, she took different companions with her, who also then entered the record books as early women. Lily Moore Rashlu in 1933 and 37. Ingeborg Denshin, who was much younger at the time, that's the only photo I have of her. Sophie Christensen, her daughter, in 1937 and Solvig Widerow in 1937. And they have all parts of the continent, parts have been named after these impressive women. Let's hear it for the women in the room. Thank you. Another contender, 1935, Carolyn Nicholson of Norway, accompanied her husband, Clarice Nicholson, a whaling captain. They landed on this peninsula here, went ashore and put in a flag. However, it's since been discovered they were on an islet off the Antarctic mainland. 
And often it's hard to know whether an eye was or not, because if ice is there, it looks like the part of the mainland, and when the ice disappears, you realise, oops, it's not. So we've since discovered the, the, the flag and the paper wasn't. Then we have another really interesting story. The first women in Antarctica, Jackie, Ronnie and Jenny Darlington, the first two women to overwinter in Antarctica. So Jackie Ronnie was born in Baltimore, Maryland, first woman to be a working member of an Antarctic expedition. She was their recorder and historian. She wrote the news releases for North American newspapers. She was, a hus she was wife of the husband of the expedition. On her way down, she was travelling with first working member, part of him on his expedition to Stonington Island. The pilot of the aeroplane on the expedition had recently been married and his wife was then come with him as far as Valparaiso and Chile. She said, come on, come with me, don't be the only woman on the expedition. So she said, yeah, what the hell? And she came down as well. However, the friendship between the two women was made very difficult because their husbands did not get along at all. Very strong little men on both sides. As a result of that, there was a lot of tension amongst the camp. A lot of old dinosaur men didn't want women there at all. They started to petition to stop the women coming. The women did come. But there's a very interesting book you can read by Jenny Darlington, My Antarctic Honeymoon, because that's where she spent a honeymoon. Both women, upon returning from Antarctica, downplayed their own role, letting their husbands take most of the credit. And they had to find ways to exist on the base where they could maintain a, a sort of friendship without upsetting their husbands and upsetting other men. So a very tricky and difficult time for them, but, but great pioneers nevertheless. The first woman scientist to work in Antarctica was Maria Klanova. She worked with an expedition of Soviet, she was a Soviet oceanographer. You can see how pleased she looks to be amongst all the <laughs> Soviet men there, really enjoying the company. So down on Antarctic stations, the ratio of men to women is generally something like this. There's, you know, 20% women, 80% men, 10% women, 90% men, 25% women, 75% men. And the women have a saying. They say, the goods are odd. No, the, the odds are good, but the goods are odd. <laughs> OK, so first woman in time, we'll give it to Christian Carolyn Nicholson, 935 followed by Ingrid Christensen with her companions and Jenny Darlington and Jackie Ronnie. We still have a few more firsts to achieve, some surprising firsts. The first birth in Antarctica. Ooh. Sylvia Morello de Palma gave birth to Amelia Palma in 1978 on the Argentine Esperanza base. She was married to the head of the base, a military um, officer of time. Argentina and Chile are very strong on wanting to have a claim on the entire peninsula. And of course, having someone born there will probably cement that as a claim. So having a child there seems the logical step. First birth at the Argentine Esperanza base, right up the very tip of the peninsula. Her husband was Captain Jorge Emilio Palma, already in the Antarctica. So what did the Chileans do? further. I'd hate to see the duty statement for that, but nevertheless. So added to their claims. So the Chilean-based President Eduardo Freeman Taula, the next birth. So on the Antarctic Peninsula we have different names. So Higgins Land in Chile, Tierra del San Martín in Argentina, formerly Palmer Peninsula in the USA, and Graham Land in Great Britain. And as Ben was talking about yesterday, we had overlaps on the Antarctic Peninsula of the three countries, Chile, Argentina and Great Britain, all have a claim on here, completely unclaimed, Norway, Australia, Tony bit for France and New Zealand. They're the Antarctic um, original claimants, part of the Antarctic Territory. All claims are suspended and the, so no one owns Antarctica. There have now been about a dozen children born in Antarctica. Eight of them born at the Antarctic Esperanza base, <laughs> Who's doing that? There used to be a little school there, a little church there, quite a, quite a community. Um, so everyone's pushing first. So my final word of advice for everyone is after following these firsts, whatever you do on this voyage, 
make it your first. Do something spectacular, make it a first. Future talks, I'll talk about Ernest Shackleton, the man behind the myth. And of course, I have to leave you with a penguin joke. Why is Antarctica the least corrupt continent? Just die. Okay, maybe we'll make it up. And again, I'll be out there deck here on level six out here signing copies of my book on the horrible and heroic history of Antarctic exploration.